Welcome to the Afghan Eye YouTube channel. If this is your first visit, make sure to subscribe and press the notification bell so that you won't miss any. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to this episode of the Afghan Eye podcast. I'm your host, Ahmad Walid Kakar, and this is episode two of season two of the Afghan Eye podcast, and in which We'll be covering the major news coming out of Afghanistan, most notably with regard to reportedly soon to be upgraded ties between the Biden administration and the Taliban. Now, before we get into that discussion, however, if you are new to the podcast, welcome. Please make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, press the notification bar so you don't miss any of our content as it comes out. Make sure also to follow us on X, formerly known as Twitter, follow us on Instagram, and please remember that our podcast is available on all major audio streaming services, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and all of the rest of them. Now, before we get into the nitty gritty of today's discussion, which is, like I said, reportedly soon to be upgraded ties between the Biden administration and the Taliban, there are a couple of developments with regard to the last episode and the topics that it discussed, of which we need to be aware. By the last episode and the topics we discussed in it, I am, of course, referring to Pakistan's ongoing expulsions of Afghan refugees, numbering into the millions. On the 14th of November, the Afghan minister or acting minister of commerce visited Islamabad as part of an official visit uh, to discuss primarily trade-related topics. Uh, one of the issues that, were, that was discussed related to the assets of refugees. If you remember, in the last episode, we discussed how many Afghan deportees were having their wealth, cash and assets seized from them by Pakistani border police prior to being deported into Afghanistan. The Afghan acting minister of commerce in these discussions discussed how to get those assets from Pakistan into Afghanistan. It's of, quite frankly, what was a disgraceful way in which the Pakistani border police had treated some of these Afghan deportees stripped of their wealth and assets prior to being deported. In addition to that, another topic that was discussed was the holding up of Afghan goods in Karachi, that is the port city in Pakistan, on which Afghanistan is hugely dependent due to its nature as a landlocked country. In addition to that, on the 11th of November, the Pakistani special representative to Afghanistan, Asif Durrani, told interviewers that peace in Afghanistan had, quote, become a nightmare for Pakistan, unquote. He was, of course, referring to what he believed were the sanctuaries given to the TTP in Afghanistan by the current government. Furthermore, on the 16th of November, Asif Durrani also told reporters at a press conference that there was a regional understanding or consensus that if and when the current Afghan government would be recognized formally across the region, that this would be done simultaneously and in concert. Now we come to today's discussion. Today's discussion relates to an article that was written for World Politics Review by Annie Forsheimer that predicted that the administration of President Joe Biden was looking to soon upgrade ties with the Taliban. Now, before we get into the nitty gritty and dissect and critique this article, it's first important to remember to ask who, what, when, where, why. Now, the author of the article is Annie Forsheimer. The article was published on the 6th of November, 2023. And the article is essentially arguing that based on a series of signs and indications in recent weeks and months from the Biden administration, that work was ongoing to upgrade ties between Kabul and Washington, and the author, Annie Forsheimer, argued why this should not be the case. Let's go into this. So, who is Annie Forsheimer? And I'm going to read out her bio. Annie Forsheimer is a non-resident associate with the Center for Strategic and International Studies. She is currently an adjunct professor at the City University of New York and a commentator and advocate on foreign policy matters. A retired career diplomat with a personal rank of minister counselor, Annie was the, was the acting deputy assistant secretary of state for Afghanistan until March 2019, and from 2017 to 2018 was the deputy chief of mission in Kabul. 
She was also the political counselor at the US Embassy in Afghanistan, is a graduate of Harvard University, and holds an MA in Security Studies from the National War College. Now, whatever our opinions on Annie Forsheimer may or may not be, or on the article we'll discuss together, it is a pretty impressive CV, or as the Americans, I'm sure, would say, a resume, an impressive resume. And she works, as I mentioned, for the Center for Strategic and International Studies in the capacity of a non-resident associate. Now, who are or what is the Center for Strategic and International Studies? And this is being quoted directly from their website. The Center for Strategic and International Studies is a bipartisan, non-profit policy research organization dedicated to advancing practical ideas to address the world's greatest challenges. The Center's purpose is to define the future of national security. Now, I'm not telling you this for no reason. The reason that I've elucidated on the biography, the CV or the resume of Forsheimer and the Center for which she works is for us to be able to appreciate and gauge the angle from which she is approaching this reportedly soon to be upgraded relationship between the Taliban and President Joe Biden's administration. The angle is one, obviously, of an American, of an American retired career diplomat with a focus on national security. It is also worth noting that the Center for Strategic and International Studies has a pretty diverse portfolio of donors. And on the website, which I will link in the description box, these donors, state and non-state actors, are listed in a lot of detail. These include, and I'm reading off the website right now, like I said, I will uh, be linking this. These include Walt Disney, these include IBM, Barclays Bank, Shell, Pfizer, the pharmaceutical company, Samsung, Raytheon Technologies Corporation, the military manufacturer, as well as Lockheed Martin, with Lockheed Martin coming in the category of $250,000 or more in terms of uh, contributions. Lockheed Martin, of course, is the defense contractor. Now, what I am not arguing is that Annie Forsheimer wrote this article because the board at Lockheed Martin or Raytheon Technologies told her to, but what I am saying is that the Center for Strategic and International Studies constitutes or forms part of the very apex of American political and financial power in terms of the fact that it can attract donations from anywhere from Amazon to military contractors all the way to Walt Disney. This is the very peak, the very apex of American power, financial, political, cultural, and everything else. Before we discuss why Forsheimer is opposed to the upgrading of ties between Washington DC and the Taliban, it's first important to ask what are the signs, the telltale signs, the indications that she has identified that do point to, in her view, soon to be upgraded ties. Now I'll go through these not one by one because there are quite a few signs that she's identified, but we'll go through about three or four of them. Number one is the proposal by the Biden administration in September that the Taliban be removed as potential targets from congressional authorizations for use of military force legislation. Essentially, delisting the Taliban as targets for legitimate military action. Number two is what she calls denigrating trusted experts. Now, this relates to a report that was written in May or June of 2023 by the UN, which was subsequently disregarded by the Biden administration. The disregarding is interpreted by Forsheimer as being denigrating, and we will go into that report in due course. Finally, there is what she calls the reordering of priorities in terms of the US's public messaging with respect to its ongoing and evolving relationship with the Taliban. She says, Forsheimer this is, quote, the US readout after meeting with the Taliban in July 2023 also praised the Taliban's counter-narcotic efforts, including their ban on poppy cultivation, as well as the production and trafficking of opium and heroin. In September, members of the Afghan American Chamber of Commerce traveled to Kabul, where they praised the Taliban government for what they called its astute handling of the Afghan economy, 
eliciting no public disavowal by the US government. So essentially, the fact that the US's public messaging is actually praising the Taliban to some extent is something that indicates soon to be upgraded ties, as well as the fact that the Chamber of Commerce was not actually condemned or disavowed by the US government, even in spite of its praising of the Taliban's governance and management of the Afghan economy. So now Forsheimer has identified a couple of signs, some of which I've mentioned, behind a growing US relationship with the Taliban. Another question is, why is Forsheimer opposed to upgrading ties with the Taliban? And there are two principal reasons, the first of which revolves around terrorism, what she perceives as the Taliban's links or the Taliban's deep relationships with terrorist organizations, the second of which relates to notions of human rights, legitimacy, and so on and so forth. Now let us dissect the first. As I mentioned, Forsheimer charges the Biden administration with, quote, denigrating UN experts, especially with regard to their report of June 2023. Now we're going to go over this report together. This report is written roughly once per year and it's written by UN experts, the experts to which Forsheimer of course refers, and they describe themselves as analytical supports and sanctions monitoring team. So as I mentioned, the monitoring team write one such report per year, but no one really knows who the authors are. Now, the report implicates the Taliban for not abiding by their counter-terrorism promises under the Doha Agreement, and the 2023 report alleges a, quote, strong and symbiotic relationship, so it's not just strong, but it's mutually reinforcing, between Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, most notably the Haqqani network. In addition to that, it casts doubt on the opium ban, which has been attested to by numerous international bodies and media, not least the BBC, and it also alleges that key Taliban members are now involved in the production and trafficking of meth, which is a new cash crop in Afghanistan, the report says. Now, there is no source whatsoever given for the accusation that the key Taliban members are involved in the production and trafficking of meth. Now, you've probably gathered that this report doesn't give a very glowing recommendation of the Taliban. Rightly or wrongly, we can get into. But it's our job to go beyond some of the claims and accusations made in this report, some of which, of course, like I said, have no reference, and really grasp the roots of the matter. Now, as I mentioned, the monitoring team writes this report once per year. And in the previous year's report, it was written that the Haqqanis are, quote, the most powerful and influential, unquote, faction in the Taliban. They were only one of many other factions, all of whom were manoeuvring to outdo one another and augment their own power. This year's report is now saying that the most powerful and the most influential figure in the Taliban is the Amir himself, Hebatullah Khanzadeh. Now there's a bit of a discrepancy here, and the discrepancy is that what happened within one year alone for one faction which was supposedly the most powerful and influential then, to now be superseded by another. That transition, assuming there is a transition, is not explained. Last year, the report wrote, the Taliban have defaulted to Pashtun favoritism, alienating minority communities in Afghanistan and running the risk that ethnic Tajik and Uzbek Taliban will become disillusioned. And so this year as well, the report also implicates the Taliban for being, quote, Pashtun-centric. Now, one of the things that I've done throughout my career as a journalist is really challenge and critique this notion that everything in Afghanistan boils down to an issue of ethnicity. And this reports rather disproportionate focus on the Pashtun nature of the Taliban, the Pashtun centricism and so on and so forth that it alleges really does raise eyebrows. Finally, the report this year actually itself admits and accepts that none of the members of the monitoring team that wrote the report actually traveled to Afghanistan. Now, the reason that this report is important and we're not relying entirely on Forsheimer's article is that Forsheimer herself is using this article to accuse the Biden administration of, quote, denigrating the UN experts that wrote this very report. And the Biden administration, of course, according to her, denigrated these experts by disregarding the recommendations and their findings. Another charge leveled against the Taliban in this report is not complying with its agreements 
or its counter-terrorism pledges in the Doha Agreement. But now I've actually got the Doha Agreement in front of me right here, or at least the publicly released version of it, because there are, of course, rumors that there are secret annexes. But given that I'm not privy to the Doha Agreement's secret annexes, I can only go by what is publicly available. And what is publicly available, we can see very quickly, is no pledge that any Al-Qaeda member or anything of the sort would be deported from Afghanistan. What's said, in fact, is that the Taliban will not allow any of its members or individuals or groups, including Al-Qaeda, to use the soil of Afghanistan to threaten the security of the United States and its allies. The Doha Agreement also says that the Taliban will send a clear message that those who pose a threat to the security of the United States and its allies have no place in Afghanistan. And it will prevent any group or individual in Afghanistan from threatening the security of the United States and its allies and will prevent them from recruiting, training and fundraising and will not host them in accordance with the commitments in this agreement. In addition to that, the Taliban is committed to deal with those seeking asylum or residence in Afghanistan according to international migration law and the commitments of this agreement so that such persons do not pose a threat to the security of the United States and its allies. So essentially, anyone that actively poses a threat is in an active state of belligerence with the United States and its allies, cannot be hosted, funded, armed, trained, given passports, registered in Afghanistan. And if they do not pose this threat, they could even be given asylum in accordance with international migration law. So the wording here is deliberately vague enough to allow both sides enough freedom of maneuver to do what they want without making any firm commitments, which could, as a result, be used as an argument by the Taliban to say, well, if people that are or were in Al-Qaeda are in Afghanistan, but they're not posing a threat to the United States and its allies, nothing about not funding them, not hosting them actually applies. Now, I can't emphasize enough how strong a word denigrating is for Forsheimer to use when accusing the Biden administration of disregarding the advice of these experts. The writings and the findings of these experts, Forsheimer argues, actually constituted the basis for US policy toward Afghanistan. And yet, be that as it may, there's another question that arises here, and that is that given that the US's policy toward Afghanistan metastasized into such a cataclysmic failure, is it possible that this was due to the fact that the advice of these experts was taken? Perhaps their advice was not as sound as it should have been. Perhaps that's partly why the US's policy was such a failure. Now, the other reason for which Forsheimer opposes uh, widened US relationship with the Taliban pertains to what we can say the human rights or the legitimacy aspect of these relations. Forsheimer actually acknowledges that there is an argument made to justify the necessity of the relationship with the Taliban insofar as it pertains to groups like ISKP. But now she says this is short-sighted for two reasons. First of which is that the help that the US could give to the Taliban against groups like Daesh or the ISKP would be very limited insofar as it pertains to inflicting casualties on Daesh and the ISKP. Number two, however, she says that this could help legitimize the Taliban's power, as in the Taliban being seen to benefit from the US's assistance against Daesh would help legitimize their power. But now, if you observe groups like ISKP and you've read their propaganda, the question that you ask is, would it really? Would it really legitimize the Taliban's power to be seen to be benefiting off the US's support? And the answer is, quite frankly, no. In fact, quite frankly, the opposite. The reasons for this are religious. The ISKP's propaganda against the Taliban primarily focuses on labeling the Taliban as US stooges and thereby excommunicating them or doing takfir of them based on their alliance or their perceived alliance with infidels, kuffar being the United States. The ISKP narrative is that the Taliban are infidels because they ally against us Muslims with other infidels. So far from, far from legitimizing the Taliban at home and in the region, 
what would be the suicide of the Taliban's ideological credentials would be any sort of public assistance or being seen to have been assisted by the United States against Daesh. The other thing that Forsheimer argues is that cooperating with the Taliban against groups like Daesh would help to encourage groups like Hamas, who she characterizes as, as extremists. And the question is, how? Well, unfortunately, Forsheimer doesn't really elaborate on how exactly Hamas would be encouraged by the US and the Taliban cooperating against Daesh. What Forsheimer does write, however, or she quotes the congratulatory message received by the Taliban from Hamas in the aftermath of the Taliban's takeover in August 2021. And what she quotes is Hamas saying that the Taliban did not, quote, fall for flashy words such as democracy and elections and false promises. Now, with all of the barbarity that we're witnessing in Israel and Gaza, it's worth asking, are Hamas really wrong? Are Hamas really wrong in saying about the Taliban that they didn't fall for flashy words such as elections and democracy? Because sometimes it's worth picturing yourself or putting yourself in the shoes and in the mind of the Orientalist Western official in whichever foreign ministry in North America and in Europe. And if you are a Western official with all of the trappings that come with the Orientalist mindset, let's do a cross analysis of the Taliban and Hamas. Hamas trim their beards. Hamas wear suits. They do not wear turbans. Hamas line their beards. They don't have beards up until here. They actually line them pretty well. More importantly than that, though, Hamas are not products of religious pre-modern seminaries. Generally speaking, they are university graduates. Hamas have not only participated in and won elections, but also believe in democracy, unlike the Taliban. Hamas do not ban women from education. So all of these things that Hamas have in their favor relative to the Taliban from the perspective of a Western official, and yet what do we see? We see cooperation with the Taliban, limited cooperation, albeit, and we see Hamas being characterized as being ISIS. Why is that? So Hamas, as much as Forsheimer and others may disagree, there's a case to be made that they're not actually wrong with respect to the Taliban. The Taliban did not fall for flashy words such as democracy and elections. The rules are not being made by us here, but they certainly are being observed. Forsheimer goes on to write that human rights and extremism are inextricably linked and the US, quote, should safeguard international norms of human rights and sanctions enforcement, not undermine them, since those tools are crucial to US national security policy making. So the argument here is that the US would be undermining human rights by expanding ties with the Taliban. And human rights are, at least in theory, supposed to constitute the crux of US national security policy making. And now I hate to be the bearer of bad news here, but if that is where fate has placed me, I have to say that if the US undermines human rights or appears to be undermining human rights, it probably is not going to be due to expanded ties with the Taliban. What undermines human rights is the Biden administration arming Israel to the teeth as it conducts a campaign of savagery across the Gaza Strip as the world watches. Finally, Forsheimer concludes that the US has important interests at stake in Afghanistan, but these should be advanced on the basis of ensuring the Taliban's respect for human rights and its verifiable rejection of terrorist groups, not appeasement. And that was all for today. Thank you for joining us on episode two of season two of the Afghan Eye podcast. Just on a side note, I really appreciate all of the comments, the likes, of our first episode and inshallah I'm looking to keep these up on a fortnightly basis at the very least. Please make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, press the notification bar, follow us on X formerly known as Twitter, follow us on Instagram and if you believe in our cause of Afghans leading the discussion with regard to Afghanistan, please consider becoming a patron on our Patreon or you can help us with a one-time donation on PayPal. Up until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.